Spirit, breathe new life in me, an appropriate prayer to begin our worship today. Good morning. Good morning. On this Pentecost Sunday, we heartily welcome you to a birthday party. A cake appropriate to this day would have better than 2,000 candles. With Pentecost, we celebrate the birthday of the Church of Jesus Christ and the coming of His Holy Spirit. So, in person or online, welcome, glad you could join us. Announcements you see posted after our service today and consistent with our party theme, a potluck. You need only bring your appetite, there's always plenty of good stuff. Um, Saturday, our men's breakfast at Perkins. Psalm 25. Is grabbing a line from the final verse where David says, My eyes are ever towards the Lord. Well, you can imagine his facing off with Goliath. If you only looked at the giant nine feet, that would be daunting. David didn't only look at Goliath. We'll be singing later from John's letter He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world, whether Goliath or Satan and all his forces, God is greater. So, for this morning of worship, let's keep our eyes on him. Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait, up, wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Let's pray. Lord, your psalmist prayed, and we pray now, make us to know your ways. O oh Lord, teach us our, your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. Lord, we pray that you would accomplish that in us this morning as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand and sing.
Mission and Pentecost, not hard. For today, let's take this from Acts first chapter, foreseeing both the birth of the church and the birth of mission outreach. Acts 4, first chapter. <clears throat> On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, couple that with another missions text, speaking of Jesus in Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You might wonder, are the crowds we encounter today any less Numerous or any less needy than those Jesus saw? This morning we turn our attention to a particular crowd of today, that of active duty military personnel. Station, as you can imagine, oftentimes out at the ends of the earth. A statistic that speaks strongly of spiritual need. The national suicide rate for active duty men, age 17 to 25, was roughly 80% higher than the suicide rate for civilian men in the same age bracket. That harvest, obviously, is both plentiful and needy. Among the harvest workers, those who seek to minister to them, Military chaplains, and that's our focus for this morning. 
In our denomination, military chaplaincy has a long history. Notable among LB chaplains, General Gaylord Gunnus, deceased a few years ago now. At retirement, he was the Chief of Chaplains of the U.S. Army. Currently, we have two active chaplains. Greg Solberg, U.S. Army, and Brian Kifat, Army National Guard, and another, Aaron Christensen, presently in the candidate stage. For this mission, mission moment, let's look at one. Brian Kifat serving in the Army National Guard. Brian says, as a Lutheran Brethren pastor serving as a military chaplain, my responsibilities are similar to those of your local pastor. I help strengthen the faith of the fellow believers in my unit, pray with people throughout the week, provide Bible studies, and share sermons on Sunday mornings. In addition to these traditional duties, I spend the majority of my time ministering to those in our ranks who are not believers. The atheist and the agnostic, the pagan, the witch, the new ager, the conjurer. I petition you to pray for a supernatural protection for me and my family as we share Jesus on the front lines of this spiritual battlefield. Thank you. This is Brian. Let's pray. Lord, for Brian, Aaron, for Gregory, we ask that you'd equip and empower and encourage and protect to make them faithful, effective witnesses among our armed services personnel. Thank you that you're calling laborers into that harvest field. Help us to remember to uphold them in prayer. Broadening our prayer focus now, Let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for and ever. Amen. O Lord of the harvest, we do indeed pray that you will call and equip workers to carry your message. For those even now preparing to go, Ellie Burke, for service in Chad, the Fraser family destined for Japan, would you open the way for them, Lord, in every way. For David and Janice in Taiwan, awaiting medical clearance, Good medical news for her for going to Chad. The Bensons, would you make effective the treatments that Linda is getting to open the way for their return to Japan? And we, Lord, we thank you that there are many responding to your call. Lord, we pray for our compassion our national young people, Francis in the Philippines, Miriam in Tanzania. May they grow in you. For Miriam, especially as she approaches graduation, Help her to stay connected to your church and its ministries as she goes on in life. Bring before you again pregnancy options in their ministry, asking that you would protect them, supply their staffing need. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. For the villages in Chad, Africa that we've invested in, Narai, Udamasa, Hileala, we pray for ongoing effective gospel witness there Lord, we pray for political stability in Chad, for everyone's good and not least that the work of your kingdom won't be frustrated. And Lord, for ourselves, health concerns, plenty, difficulties that might discourage us, burdens that are hard to bear. Lord, help us to embrace your sufficiency as we cry to you. And now, Lord, open ears and hearts to your word, as Dan brings it to the kids and to us all. In Jesus' name, amen.
You know, I mean, when I was a, a kid, uh, every once in a while, you know, I'd get a, a gift. I remember I used to get um, Christmas gifts from my uh, aunt. And, oh man, <laughs> Steve got the same kind of thing, you know, kind of stuff. You think, where in the world does this person get this idea? You know, well, I had, you know, you get older, the same thing can happen. I was, my wife, her birthday, you know, what in the world? <laughs> she was cut for my birthday. I did, you know, what's this good for? Well, I mean, I suppose it's good for something. I mean, I can, I can wipe my desk off with it. I can... I could swap mosquitoes, you know, or, or, or flies, or, um... I mean, these are really good, really nice. I mean, just look at this. Wow. Yeah, put, put that one on. So that's why it looked like a hand. Yes, you can do all kinds of things, like when you're outside mowing the lawn, or when you're working in the dirt, or just to protect your hands against slivers, you know, whatever it is you need. So see, they are great. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> right. Well, 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 thank you, thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, Jesus, when he was with his closest friends, he kept giving them a hint, little hints, about a gift he was going to give them. And he just kind of, the longer he was with them, the more he just kind of talked about this wonderful gift. And, and they undoubtedly were wondering, well, why can't I have it now? But Jesus said, no, it's not ready yet, but it's coming. And on this day of the year in the church, we celebrate something called Pentecost. Because that was the day that Jesus delivered that wonderful gift. Who is called the Holy Spirit. And you know, when I was young, I didn't understand too much about the Holy Spirit when I was a little guy. But I discovered something about that gift. You know, some gifts, you kind of get them and you play with them and, you know, and then you don't think about it much after that. This Holy Spirit gift, it gets better and better and better the older you get. And you'll discover that gives you that gift too. We're going to sing about that. Greater is he that is in you. That's the Holy Spirit. We'll stand as we sing. to the bank and you receive it. There was a feast, I mean a real feast, kind of like one of our potlucks only much, much bigger. It lasted eight days. The population of Jerusalem swelled to many times its size. Jewish people from all over the Mediterranean world 
They came by boat. They came by carts. They walked. And they, and they descended on Jerusalem for this wonderful thing they called the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the things that they did in this Feast of Tabernacles, they were remembering what happened when they were in the desert, when their forefathers were in the desert, and they completely run out of water. And they were thirsty. The priests at this, at this great feast were remembering that, they would go down to the pool of Siloam, and I imagine they had probably a, one of these um, supports around your neck, and they would have these big jars of water uh, for water. And they would go down there, a whole bunch of them, and they would fill these, these jars of water from the pool of Siloam. And then, with, you know, innumerable, hundreds, thousands of, of people following them up the street, the road up into the temple. They'd be singing the great psalms like we sing, praising God. And they would get up there, and then what the priests would do, they did something interesting. They poured the water out on the ground in the temple, or in the temple courts, and the water would go and flow down the streets in Jerusalem as crowds and crowds of people were coming up. It was a celebration of that time when in the desert, and they were so thirsty, God had created an enormous river to come out of some rocks. And what, one of the things they were doing in this remembrance of that feast is they were praying for rain. Because Israel is a rather arid land. I think it was Ben-Gurion who said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but unfortunately, not with water. And so they prayed for rain. And Jesus, on the last day of the feast, the great day, stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John goes on to describe, I mean, to explain what he was talking about. He said, now this Jesus said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in Jesus were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, some time later, they celebrated Pentecost. The coming of the Spirit. Now, Jesus said, now these people, now these people weren't a bunch of pagans. These people were devoutly religious Jews. They were there because they, they're, they're in their religion, they were, they were practicing their devotion to God. Why was Jesus saying this to them? If anyone is thirsty, Well, I think he would be seeing, he's saying the same thing to us. Many of us could probably talk about a time when even as Christians, we really kind of suffered a, a, a lack of a sense of real assurance that, you know, that we were in a right with God, relationship. Sometimes we get troubled by the fact that in our humanity there were, that there were sinful people. 
We sometimes, you know, we crave that sense the, uh, uh, the, to have God's love, to have his peace, to have his joy. Sometimes, and particularly as we get older, we want to have that hope. We want to be able to look forward to something that is beyond this world. Others, at times, a sense of a purposeful life. Or how about a confidence in prayer that God is answering our prayers? How about times when we wonder, is the service, the things that I am doing, is it really meaningful? Well, any of those things and any number of other kind of signs of spiritual thirst are true, we'd have to say then that at least in some ways, religion, that religion is the practice of faith. And it's a very good thing. It has to be. It's the only way we can practice it. But somehow, it's not quenching a certain thirst. If any man comes to me, he thirsts, come to me. Religion is, it's the practice of faith, both in public and in private. It's what we do. We pray. We, you know, we listen to the word of God. We, you know, we give offerings. We, we worship. We do all those things. Come to me. What are we saying? Is he telling you, come do something for yourself to measure up? Some place you should go, something you should experience. Is that what he is saying? He says, to those who believe in me. What does that mean, to believe in me? I mean, every, most everybody believes that Jesus existed and that he was a good guy and all of this kind of thing. But who is this one who, who basically was claiming to be the one who brought water out of rocks? He was claiming to be the Jewish Messiah, but that Messiah was bigger than the Jewish people ever believed. That he was divine. He's the great I Am of the Old Testament. Believe in me. To believe in what I say. Everything I say, to believe in it. Not just the things that I like, but even the things I don't like, to believe in it. To believe in all the things that I did and what it accomplished for you. I love the word for faith that, that John uses to receive. There is the truth about Jesus. I receive it. He gives it. That's active. I receive it. That's active. I embrace it with my heart. He who believes in me. And of course, faith just grows from little children all the way up to old people like me. Faith will keep growing. Whatever place you are in life, wherever it is, you may not understand all these wonderful things, you know, but Jesus said, you come to me. Believe in me. Rivers of living water will flow out of me into your inner being. I love the fact that he didn't say it would be a pool. You watch this pond out here. Would, would you drink out of that um, every day of the year? You might on some days when it's beautiful like this, and other days it's full of scum. Pools stagnant. Jesus said, rivers, they flow through. They are always fresh and lively, and it's a living water. He said that the Spirit of God is going to be with you. He is going to be in you. You will be born 
reborn by the Spirit and in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit represents Jesus Christ in everything. Who he was, what he said, what he did. The role of the Holy Spirit is to represent Christ in everything about him and communicate it to you. It's intensely personal. You're not a number. You're not just a category. Jesus said, the Spirit is given to you. You have a name. He knows your name. How does it just happen? The Holy Spirit inhabits the Word of Christ. Paul said, He's God, the Scriptures are God-breathed. Spirited. It's the Holy Spirit that writes that word on your heart. Through the word of Christ, the Holy Spirit inhabits that word. Now here's kind of the point I'm really making this in, in my message this morning. Through the word of Christ that the Holy Spirit inhabits, He brings spiritual life to your religion, to the practices of your faith. In the proclamation of the Word of God, whether you're reading it or hearing it, you're seeing it. The Holy Spirit is teaching you the truth. The Holy Spirit is guiding you in the truth so that when you are living and making your all of your own personal life decisions in, in, in your own personal life, the Holy Spirit who inhabits the Word is guiding and teaching you in His Word. You can have the mind of Christ in worship. Oh, we sang some glorious songs. I picked them. They were glorious songs. But I'll tell you why. Because in worship, remember the Holy Spirit, He inhabits the Word. The Word is expressed in those great hymns. And when I sing those songs, the Holy Spirit is singing him back to me. Holy, holy, holy. He is holy. Shine, Jesus, shine. He's singing him right back to me. That's worship with the Word of God. Well, how about the sacraments? We call the sacraments the means of grace. Why? Because the Holy Spirit inhabits the sacraments. In baptism, The Holy Spirit, he, Jesus says that he likes to say that he will recall to your mind what he has said to you. What does the scripture say about it? That I was baptized into Christ. That means who I am, everything. That I am everything that I have. I was baptized into Christ. And the Spirit is going to recall that to my mind. Every time we ever see it practiced. The Lord's Supper. We are in communion in Christ's sacrifice. And I might come in fear. I might come in doubt. I might come in temptation. I might come with a sense of real guilt. But as I receive the body and blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit is recalling to me that it is in that sacrifice that my sin, all of it, is forgiven. It's just wiped out. It's cleansed. It's a means of grace. Oh, man, yes. How about prayer?
Jesus tells us, ask and you'll receive. And we do a lot of asking. How do I know what to ask for? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 8, you know, through the word of God, the Holy Spirit who inhabits that word through the word of God. God tells us what he wants us to ask. In service, the Holy Spirit is deeply invested in our service. He says, I have given you a gift. Every one of us has gifts that he specially gives to us as individuals to serve. The Holy Spirit who inhabits the word shows us through the word how to serve him effectively. the simple practice of our religion in private in public through the word of Christ the Holy Spirit communicates Jesus love Jesus peace Jesus joy through the word he communicates it to us Well, as he said, he will take what is mine. Jesus said, talking about the Spirit, he will take what is mine, my love, my joy, my peace, and he will give it to you through his word, inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Well, drink. How do we do that? You know, the Holy Spirit is, um, he loves to give surprises. And you see, on Pentecost, it was a good example. Little tongues of fire, and speaking in languages you, didn't, you never knew. Uh, you know, and, and throughout the, the New Testament, the book of Acts, you see how he surprises people. And, 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 and I think all of us have experienced at times I sometimes, you know, rarely I'd be standing on the top of a mountain. And, and it's just, I remember Philip Yancey said that one of the reasons he believes in God is because of classical music. I mean, the Holy Spirit has many things he can do, but there is one thing that he has promised. You can say, I can never, I can go climb the mountain the second, the, you know, the next year. And it's not there. I mean, the mountain's there, but I don't have that experience. I can never really, in searching out spiritual experiences, you know, all these things that the Spirit might do, he might, or he probably doesn't. But there is one thing he has promised. I will always visit you through the word of Christ. Because I inhabit that word. And I, I am here in order to communicate Jesus to you. What does it mean to drink? Jesus said to the churches in Revelation, He said, In your religion, I mean, that was my adding to it, but, but it kind of meant practices there. In your religion practices, Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. Really listen. In your hymn singing, listening, Word of God, in our prayers, and our service, and the sacraments, listen to what the Spirit really listens. 
public or private. Pentecost is personal. Spirit came to apply Christ to you in your life, in the circumstances of your individual life. It's to you. He knows your name. John Wesley was a pastor in the United Kingdom. He came to America as a missionary. And he returned feeling defeated. He was spiritually desperately thirsty. And he sat in one evening in a chapel meeting. And the guy who was leading it, he was reading. He was reading Martin Luther's introduction to his, to, to his commentary on the book of Romans. Just listening to this guy read as Martin Luther spoke about the word of God to Paul through Romans. And he said later, he said, I felt my heart strangely warm. And that was the beginning of the great Wesleyan revival that changed England. You see, God loves the world. Jesus died for the world. It is the Holy Spirit who has come to make it personal to you. Let's sing a, a prayer in response to this. What did Jesus say? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Breathe on the breath of God. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Amen. Our doxology. <laughs> Amen. 
Jesus. 